Week 30 of Stop Believing Satan's Lies. Hallelujah. And uh, if you listen to some of the messages of the last 30 weeks, you say, well, Pastor Mike's contradicting what he believes in, so forth and so on. And, uh, um, th th there's no contradiction at all. And I want to state that I believe strongly, firmly with every fire of my being that we are anointed and empowered by God to walk in victory. I believe strongly that God gives us the name of Jesus to advance the kingdom of God. I believe strongly in the power of prayer. I believe strongly in the confession of uh, a right confession in our mouth. I believe strongly in seeding for blessings. I believe strongly in, 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 in calling things that are not as though they are. I believe strongly in the prayer of healing. I just don't believe in those things as an end to get where you belong. As a method to get where you belong. I believe in those things. I believed in those things. They work for me. And if they don't work for you, God bless you. You're doing something wrong. Because they do work. I believe in the power of the blood. But I don't believe it's a method to an end result. I don't believe you can use the power of the blood. I don't believe you can use the name of Jesus and not understand the principles of that. It is not a method. I am against preachers and teachers that sell these ideas as a method to obtain something from God. So all you got to do is believe. How many believers we got here? How many believers we got? Okay, and you believe. But how many believers we got here that all your belief in the world didn't get what you was praying for? So when we sell godly principles as an idea of a method, you become disillusioned, dissatisfied, discontented with God and church. You just become a byword what the Bible talks about, and you become just a, 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 a lump sitting in church. You have no enthusiasm, you have no excitement, you have no joy. You're a stumbling block to somebody that has joy. I'm not just saying that. The Word of God tells us that. I don't believe that they are methods. It's all about relationship. Amen. And one of the things that's missing in the body of Christ today is relationships. You don't get a relationship by a prayer meeting. You don't get a relationship by just crying out to God. You don't get a relationship just by reading the Bible alone. So like, I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in all those other things, but those alone will not get you your blessings from God. Those alone will not deliver you. Right. Have you ever cast down a thought that didn't line up with God and that thought remained there? Because you relied on the principle of casting down the thought. It's not the principle alone that delivers you. So I'm against, you know, if you want to be blessed by God, send $20 to my uh, uh, ministry and I'll send this beautiful plaque that says, my God shall supply all your needs. You can put it on your wall. You can confess it every day and God's going to bless you. You mean God's going to bless you with the $20 I sent you? <laughs> Cost $5 at most to send that plaque. They profited 15% and they robbed you of your confidence in God. It's amazing. I mean, I, I, I am blown away by people that uh, have no confidence in God. It shocks me how you could sit in church 10, 15, 20 years and, and have no confidence in God. At some point, you've got to lose confidence in the man. At some point, you've got to lose confidence in the institution of the religion. And you've got to get confidence in God because God never fails. It's the preachers that are not preaching the truth to you that makes it fail. Go to Hebrews 10, 35. We're going to break it down today. Let's read. Do not therefore fling away your fearless confidence, for it carries a glorious compensation of reward. As I said last week, if the enemy can get your confidence, you do not get your reward. You have to have confidence. How many went to work this week? Did you go to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? What did you expect Friday? What did you expect Friday? Did you wake up Friday morning? See, I hope my paycheck's there. They better have my paycheck there. And when you clocked in, every hour was your paycheck on your mind? No, you had confidence. If you got direct deposit, you have confidence that that paycheck was going to be there. 
If you don't have direct deposit, you have confidence that when you got off work, they were going to hand you that paycheck and say, well done, thou good and faithful employee. But when we've been robbed of our confidence in God, we doubt the reality of his, I want to, for, for lack of a better way of saying it, his payment plan. Is God going to bless me? Is God going to keep me? Is God going to strengthen me? He says, do not fling it away. Without confidence, you have very little standing for the promises of God manifesting themselves in your life. It is not just a cliche. My God supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Just quoting that scripture alone does not guarantee you, <coughs> excuse me, God will meet your needs. By his stripes I am healed. Just quoting that scripture alone is not, a, is not a guarantee. It is a method. Yeah. Applying the, 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 the blood, applying the scriptures is nothing short of a method if you don't have the relationship to impact the scriptures you're quoting. Right. But man has given us methods for hundreds of years that we bought into it because we want a quick fix Healing, quick fix deliverance, quick fix victory in God without the effort. Right. Believers who lost confidence in God have no strength in them to trust God. They have no more strength. You want to know why the worship services are so dry? They have no more strength to worship. They've given all they have given. And they have no more to give. They can't backslide because they know God's real. They can't give up because they know God's real. So they just come in with a lethargic, dry, stale attitude in worship, a lethargic, dry, stale, nitpicking, fault-finding attitude to sing praises, to hear the word of God, and of service to God. It is a joy. You woke up this morning. God empowered you with victory when you woke up. God gave you an assignment that you could worship him. God gave you an assignment that you be an example. God gave you an appointment to come before him. How can you come in lethargic, dead, dry, and stale? Because the methods ain't been working for me. But I know it's real, but so I'm going to keep coming. You lost confidence in God. When you lose confidence in God, you can't surrender to God. Can we please turn our phones off and pay attention to the word of God and stop disrespecting the house of God and the word of God? That's what, why are we on these things here when we're at church? Because you have no confidence, no respect, and no reverence for the things of God. Hello? Well, my church pastor, now your pastor should have. Your pastor should have taught you reverence for the things of God. Why are you sick? Why are you diseased? Why are you perverted? Why things ain't working right? Because you have no reverence for the things of God. I'm not apologizing for my position, for my stand. I know it offends people, but I'd rather offend you than offend God. They have lost confidence in God because of the pulpits across America. People lost confidence in God because the preachers ain't doing their job. Preachers today are trying to run around and get everybody to like them, pat them on the back so they can get invites, so they could be everybody's friend. I ain't interested in being your friend. I've told a lot of people, I ain't your friend, I'm your pastor first. Don't come at me like I'm your friend, because I ain't your friend. You're going to get mad when I come at you as your pastor if you think I'm your friend. Amen. But if I come at you in a manner that, that, that you know that a pastor is supposed to come, I just go, oh, that's the pastor. What you expect? <laughs> they were wounded by the one that was supposed to bring healing to them. They're wounded by the one that's supposed to disciple them. They're wounded by the one that's supposed to train them to be warriors and soldiers. We throw those words around and, uh, 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 like, like it means nothing. I'm a warrior for Jesus. You're a cupcake. You're a cream puff. You're a foo-foo man. That's what we're raising today. I'm a soldier for Jesus. Oh, you hurt my feelings. What kind of soldier? What kind of soldiers walking around hurt, talking about their hurt feelings? You know, the general told me to stand over there, and he didn't say please. No. The officer in charge gave a command, and he expected you to follow the command. Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 3. Verse 15. Hallelujah. Listen to what God said. He said that this, would, this is what he would do in the last days, and God's raising them up. He said, and I will give you a pastors according to what? 
according to his heart. I will give you men and women of God that have my heart, which will feed you with knowledge and understanding. He didn't say they will feed you with a feel-good message. He did not say that they will be sensitive to your feelings and your emotions because you're just a little cream buff and you need to be coddled. He said, I will feed you, they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. We're being fed with knowledge and understanding of methods. We're being fed with knowledge and understandings of religion. We're being fed with knowledge and understanding of how to obtain the blessings of God. But are we being fed with knowledge and understanding about the character and the nature of God and how he expects us to walk so we can employ miracles in people's lives? He said, you're the light of the world. He says, you, you are the hope of this world. You're blessed to be a blessing. He said, what you have in you, you're supposed to stir it up so that you can bring victory and joy to other people. But how many of us have so, lost so much confidence in God that we can't even bring victory to ourselves, let alone somebody else? We're feeling this. They're supposed to feed us with understanding and knowledge, and they haven't done that. Many Christians, instead of being built up in the faith, were wounded by the, by the men that fed them with man-made principles void of the power of God. Man-made principles void of the power of God. It may work calling things that are not as though they are. It may work by a method that somebody taught you for a season so the enemy can, can, can grab you and get your attention and make you think it's reality. The Bible says Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. So you buy into that thing and it works for your season, then you're going to start selling another book and another book and another book, or you're going to buy another book and another book. How many of us have all these man-made principle books at home? Collecting dust, dust because it ain't working no more. My Bible says, call upon me, him. He says, I will answer you. He didn't say use Jerry Seville. He didn't say use Oral Roberts. He didn't say use Kenneth Copeland's uh, uh, principles and methods. He said, call upon me. See, I can't call on any of those men. But I could call upon an almighty God. Amen. I had a friend of mine that we, we used to call him Thunderlung. He only had one lug. He was, he was uh, living on the railroad tracks on, 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 on Fifth Avenue in Oakland. And he was bleeding internally. Blood was coming out of his mouth. And he was raised in church. And he called on God. He said, God, if you heal me, if you save me, I'll serve you. The blood dried up like that, and he turned, became a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People made fun of him and mocked him because he was so full of zeal and excitement and joy. Amen. But God touched him, and he learned the reality of a God instead of man-made principles. Today, they want the man of God to so go to some Bible school, kill his anointing, and feed him full of knowledge. That means absolutely nothing. Come on, somebody say Amen. They have all these principles void of the power of God. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14. I, I, you know. <laughs> and here's why the enemy uses these things so that he can destroy you. He don't care, my friend, if you're sitting in church for the next 20 years. He can care less if you're church. He wants, in church. He wants to make sure you're ineffective. Where is your excitement for serving? Listen to this. A living God. I ain't serving some God that's dead. I'm not serving God, some God that can't be touched by my infirmities. I'm not serving some God, abstract God up in the sky somewhere. I'm serving a God that is intimately involved in the daily affairs of my life. Well, how do you know that? Because I delight myself in him and he grants me the desires of my heart. I don't even have to think about it. All of a sudden, doors start opening. All of a sudden, peace starts coming in my life. All of a sudden, unity starts coming in where there was unrest. Amen. Without any effort of mine because I have a relationship. And he said, that's my son. I'm going to restore him. See, we need restoration. Amen. You're not going to get it by a list of rules. You're going to get it by he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. You're going to get it by hearing what God has to say. And you know what he might be telling you? You're too machismo. You got too much pride. You got too much ego. You got too much self. Humble yourself and I'll lift you up. Right. So if the enemy can wound your spirit, you don't have the faith to believe, trust in God anymore. I've been serving the Lord. It's about 40 years. 
And I can count on one hand how many men started with me that have the Z. Actually, I can't. I can't count on five fingers. Have the same excitement and seal that they had 40 years ago. Some of y'all have been with me for more than 20 years, and I still got it. Not that I got it, it's burning in me. It's something inside of me. I'm not manufacturing it. I touched the hand of the Almighty God and it stirred something up inside of me. And when, it's, when that's stirred up inside of you, it doesn't matter what the doctors report. It doesn't matter what B of A says. It doesn't matter what the wife says. It doesn't matter what the children say. It doesn't matter what the, what, what the husband says. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. You stay stirred up because he's operating in your life. But the problem is we listen to the lies of the enemy. We allow our confidence to be robbed. And oh my God, is God going to handle this? Just like he did before. Listen to this. The strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble. But a weak and broken spirit, who can raise him up? That's why the enemy uses altar calls to break your spirit and confidence in the altar call because he breaks your spirit. Well, I can't go do that no more because I tried it 20 times before and it didn't work. Do you know how many times I've been attacked because of altar call? See, after service, he didn't have an altar call. I'm out of here, heretic. Why am I going to feed your dysfunctionalism making you think you're going to get something up here when God empowered you to get it? You've just been absolved of your responsibility which left you with a broken spirit. When the altar call comes, it ought to be, gee, I hope God's going to heal me. It ought to be, God, it's my turn. Here I am. Like the blind Bartimaeus, Jesus! Jesus is here. Don't pass me by. I need a healing. I need my eyes fixed. I need my back fixed. I need my deliverance. What do you mean shut up? You don't got what I got. You don't need what I need. A broken spirit who can bear it. He said, nobody. But you know what it takes? A lot of humility for somebody to say, you know what? I've been in error all these years. And because of our stupid, foolish, religious upbringing... We allow that to get in the way of the anointing of a living God. We allow that to stop the flow of the anointing. I'm not just seeing that. Go to Proverbs 17. Verse 22, let's read. A happy heart is good medicine. A happy heart is good medicine. And a cheerful mind works healing. A cheerful mind works healing. Now, I don't care who you are. At times, your mind is not going to be cheerful. For the last week, I've just been miserable. <laughs> Tired. Can't get no energy. Can't wait to go home and take a nap. Am I talking to anybody? The minute I walk in, oh, God, I'm tired. And just about four days ago, about four days ago, I took a shower. And I'm in there complaining. God, this was like getting old. I don't like it. I'm tired. A cheerful mind works healing. And the voice of God came in that shower. He said, stop complaining. I, wow. I didn't know I was. I was being real. These are 70 year old bones, man. They're not 25. I was just being real. I go, oh, God, I'm sorry. And I start, you know what? I've had energy ever since that moment I stepped out of that shower. Why? Because I changed my mind. Change your mind. Stop believing the lies of the devil. It's not the end of the road because you're having a hard day. It's not the end of life because things ain't working your way. Change your mind. But a broken spirit dries up the bones. 
The enemy doesn't have to do anything but play a sad song for you. Put a sad movie on TV. I used to have a hard time watching movies where the dad would go toss the ball with his son. I'd suck up the tear and go in the next room. I never had that. So I seen guys that had that, man, it would hit here. All the enemy had to do was put those kind of movies on and it brought me down. What kind of movies you got to play for you to bring you down? And don't even realize it's the movies you're watching that are affecting your spirit. So you keep watching them because they make you feel a wounded spirit affects your health and your mind more than the gym and diet. Let me say that again. A wounded spirit affects you greater than your diet or exercise. So what is your spirit today? Do you allow the enemy by what he tells you to affect your spirit? I don't want to forget that moment in the shower. If you desire to know God and walk in his blessings, stop believing Satan's lies. Reject it. (coughs) We've been talking about it for 30 weeks now. It doesn't matter who's preaching the sermon. If it's not lining up with the word of God, not with your theology, with the word of God. I was taught theology. I studied theology. But when I found out that the theology did not line up with the word of God and not my subjective thinking about the word of God. See, God ain't interested in what you think about his word. Amen. We think that God, God's just waiting on you for you to become grown so you could tell him what to do. Kind of sounds like our 16-year-old children. You can't operate in the authority of God without meeting his pre-qualifications. So if that does away with principles, salvation is free. You can do nothing to earn salvation. But there are pre-qualifiers in order to obtain the blessings of God. Sarah just received her masters. Some of y'all received your masters. She couldn't have got, she could not graduate as much as she wanted to, graduate from high school, say, okay, give me my master's. I'm gonna go to school for four years. No, she had to do certain things to qualify so she can go to learn her masters or to, uh, to, to gain her masters. What makes you think you're just going to come to God, learn a principle in Jesus' name, cha-ching? How many times have you used the name of Jesus and got mad because it did not work? And here's the thing. When you employ it wrong, it works because it's not God. It's an angel of light. We were on a cruise, and there was a sister there, and she was, you know, when you go on the cruises, you can go out to take you out, I think, three miles, and you can get, there's gambling on ship, and it's perfectly legal. She was using the name of Jesus for the, a one-armed bandit. <laughs> what else? The roulette, not the roulette, the uh, slot machine. Hey, Amen. she's standing next to me. She goes, in the name of Jesus. I go, no. <laughs> but she was winning, so I couldn't convince her that it was wrong. <laughs> and the enemy would keep her going there, enslaved, to that method, think of that as work. And it worked there, but what about when she needs it for healing for somebody? What about when she needs it to protect her, to keep something that she's ready to lose? It will not work because it's more than a method. If you believe it's just a method, you will be broken in spirit and you'll not be able to call upon him. It may work for a season, but what happens for week after week and month after month and year after year, you get disillusioned because it's not working. And I, you know, We're serving an almighty God. How can we be disillusioned with him? It is excitement. Whenever something tragic is coming my way or when there's something that's impossible coming my way, I'm excited to see how God's going to move. And God ain't going to move until I stay faithful. Turn your Bibles over to Luke chapter 9. 
operate in the authority of God without meeting his pre-qualifications. Luke 9, 54. Let's read. And when the disciples, James and John, observed this, they said, Lord, do you wish us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? I want you to notice, Jesus did not tell the disciples they don't have that authority. He did not tell them you're, you, you, that's not your place. They had the authority to command fire to come from da- down from heaven just as Elijah did. But here's what he told them. He turned to them and he rebuked them, severely censored them. He said, you do not know what sort of spirit you're in. You know what he's saying? You're not in the place of purpose where you can do it. You, don't, you have not met the pre-qualifiers to bring fire down from heaven. Why aren't the blessings of God in my home? Because I got methods and I have not met the pre-qualifiers. Here's what he said. He, 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 said, he said, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 28, he said, blessings are run you down and take you over. Why ain't they happening? Because I'm not in the place of purpose for them to manifest themselves. I don't need to pray. I don't need to ask. I don't mean I don't mean to pray. I don't need to pray for a blessing because the Bible says he knows what I have need of even before I ask. So if there's healing in my body, instead of us praying, we're begging. We're begging a God who's willing to give it to us. We're begging a God who desires for us to walk in perfect, he- in perfect health. We're, we're begging a God that wants us to prosper so he can show us off. Because we're not walking in the blessings that he commanded us to walk into where those blessings will just overtake us. I don't know about you, but I have not had blessings run me down and take me over yet. And I'm going slow so they might. (laughs) And people use that scripture to get you all pumped up. Oh yeah, blessing going to run me down. Not if you ain't right there, not. Not if you're, you know, money cometh. No, don't get me wrong. I believe we could do those things and they will happen as the Spirit leads. Them that are led by the Spirit, not principles. Them that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. And we realize your sonship in God, the blessings run you down and take you over. But we're hung up on methods because we we ain't got time to do it the long way. So I remember when I was in school, we had long division and short division. That's really dating me. When I learned short division, ooh, I like this. Long division takes too long. He says, you don't know what kind of spirit you are in. Many of us were offended with God, but we ain't going to say we're offended with God. You know, if you've got 10,000 unanswered prayers... What are you going to do if you're married to somebody and you ask them 10 questions and they don't give you a response? Are you going to say, oh, well, no big deal. Go in there and make their favorite meal? Are you going to say, oh, oh, no, that's okay, honey, let's go out and eat? No, you're going to give them back what they gave you, which was nothing. Some of us are doing that to God. We feel God ain't done nothing for us, so we allow our emotions, we allow our attitudes not to be responsive in worship and praise. Listen, we're not understanding this. We have the privilege, the right, and the authority to call upon his name. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, they understood that and the priests began to worship the Lord and they fell out under the power because they operated in the authority God called them to do when they called upon his name. Today we lift up our hand, one hand in worship or we're caught up in a bunch of stupidity, a bunch of foolishness that has nothing to do with the righteousness of God, giving God half-hearted worship, wondering why I'm sick, wondering why I'm afflicted, wondering why things ain't working right in my life because you're only giving him your leftovers. Because you think that's what he gave you. I called on God 20 times and he answered one prayer. Now I don't know about you, but that's not the kind of God that I serve, nor is that the kind of God, that's not the God of the Bible. 
I don't know, I don't know what kind of God you've been, you, you, you were fed, but that's not the God of the Bible. Go over to Matthew chapter 10. Hallelujah. Verse 38, let's read. I'd like to finish this today if the Holy Spirit leads me. I got a sequel to this message. Is stop believing Satan's lies. That's this one. The next one the Holy Spirit gave me is stop believing your lies. <laughs> Amen. They're two different lies. They're two different lies. Here is the prequalifier for his blessings in your life. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me, cleave steadfastly to me, conforming wholly to my example. Who are you conforming to? Some of us like to conform to the Godfather. Or Snoop Dogg, or whoever it is. You want your lifestyle to portray that gangster image. When God is saying, conform to the image of my son. In living and if need be in dying also is not worthy of me. We're saying if, if you're not conforming to my image, you're not worthy of the blessings that I bring. You're not worthy of the kingdom that I represent. Yes, amen. We're not interested in spiritual things the way they used to be. I could just think 20, 30 years ago, my God, the church was, had some uh, 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 true spirituality in it. We come gathered together, we wanted the fellowship, but we wouldn't separate. Today we come give God one hour of our time, and we can't wait to get out and go do our thing. I was raised, and I was raised, but spiritually I was raised, that Sunday is the Lord's day. I'm coming here, I'm going to see what the Lord has in mind. I'm not going to believe the lies of the devil and just, you know, live any way I want to live and expect that I can receive something from God. After all, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all righteousness. But he said, if you don't pick up your cross and follow me. Sometimes picking up my cross means I have to deny myself my right to get explosive. I have to deny myself my right to have a pity party. I have to deny myself my right to do whatever I want to do and follow him. Amen. These are pre-qualifiers that do not talked about much. As I said before, salvation is free. But his blessings are going to cost you something. Right here, he says it's going to cost you everything. One, one particular version says, here it is, whoever finds his lower life, he's talking about here on earth. You think chasing the gold, the glamour, and all the gals is a high life? He says, this is a lower life. He's saying, I've got something much better for you. He says, you'll lose the higher life. And whoever loses his lower life on my account will find the higher life. So what are you chasing today? Are you chasing the will of God? Or are you chasing the dollar bill? Are you chasing the plan of God in your life? Are you chasing that four-bedroom house and that picket fence with 3.2 children and a dog and a cat? They're pre-qualifiers. Salvation's free. You want God to operate in your life? It's going to cost you a relationship with him. So we have greater and deeper relationships with one another than we do God. My greatest relationship is with God. My greatest influencer is God. Not you or anybody I know. It's God is my influencer. He directs, he dictates, he commands. I show up. He's won my trust over the years. And it doesn't matter if what he's commanded me to do is contrary to what everybody else is doing. I trust him that it will be all right because he's never failed me yet. Relationship. We spend time with one another, but do we spend time with God? I'm not talking about prayer. 
I'm not talking about a prayer time because a prayer time is something you set apart for. Right? I got my, I did my one hour. I'm okay. How about when you're in relationship with somebody and they want to intrude after the one hour? How about when they want to intrude when you're just falling asleep? How about they want to intrude and it's four o'clock in the morning and you got to get up in a half hour and you want that extra half hour of sleep? I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit starts calling you. Can he intrude on your time? When you got plans and the Holy Spirit makes a plan and puts a demand on your anointing because somebody needs you, do you make excuses, I'm sorry I can't come, or I'm going to do something? Can he intrude on your time frame so that you could save a soul or deliver somebody from hell? Most times, no. Can God intrude on your family that you, now that you got them together? You got to remember, it was God that put them together. And he put them together because at one time you allowed yourself to, li- to give up your lower life so you could find the higher life, and now you're exchanging it. John chapter 15. See, a lot of people, they don't like this message. You know why they don't like this message? Because they're used to nandy-pandy preachers that preach to the pocketbook. They're used to nandy-pandy preachers that pat you on the back and tell you everything's okay. You could act any way. You could do anything you want in their church, and it's perfectly fine with you. I'm reminded of the, uh, uh, of the two men walking down the Amos Road, and Jesus come by, and he said something to them. He started opening up the scriptures, and Jesus walked away, and they told him, he said, did not our hearts burn in us while he opened unto us the scriptures? When's the last time a man of God spoke to you, and your heart burned in your heart? He said, our heart was being pulled. There was a tug. I experienced this the first time I ever heard the gospel message preached by an evangelist by the name of Skipper Cordova. I sat in the back of the church and I had never heard anybody preach like this in my entire life. And he stopped the message. He said, there's somebody sitting here, right here in the back. One of you is sitting back there. And he says, there's a tug at your heart. I had never heard the gospel message preached under the anointing and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we got men and women that are dead, that are stale in God. They don't like the conviction. They don't like the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They don't like the word. Can't you preach the word of God soft and tender and gentle and full of love? They don't understand or appreciate it. Neither did all the other disciples. But the two that he met on the uh, Emus Road, he said, did not our heart burn in us? Was there not a stirring up in us as he opened up the gospel of Jesus Christ? As he opened up the scriptures, there was something moving in us. Now, I know, see, some of us were so spoiled because you get that almost every week. (laughs) Almost every week there's a stirring up of your soul, and that's the way it ought to be. See, but when you lost your joy, when you lost your zeal, when you're believing in the lies of the devil, you want every preacher to be conformed into Mr. (laughs) Snuffleupagus. Amen. (laughs) Some old goofy guy. Let's read. Relationship. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing fruit, he cuts away, he trims it off, he takes it away. And he cleans and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit. To make it bear more fruit and richer fruit and more excellent fruit. You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I have given you, the teachings I have discussed with you. Dwell in me and I dwell in you. Live in me and I will live in you. Just no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding and being virtually united to the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. You know what he's saying? Without me you can do Nothing. I love new love. I love watching new love. I love you. No, I love you. I love you more. No, I love you more. Amen. Like, (laughs) amen. Come on, you know you were thinking of it. (laughs) Amen. 
it's like they're not even a person without each other. But yet they get nothing accomplished. But make us all talk about them. <laughs> Amen. Man, I'd like to invite him out for lunch, but he's not the same person without her. So I guess I got to take her too if I want to spend time with him. Don't get mad at me because I'm talking about you. (laughs) That's what Jesus is saying. He said, unless you're connected to me like that, you can't do nothing. But see, we don't see the value in that because that's out here. I can't see God. I can't see him. All I know is all the letdowns I had in him. All I know is the disappointments I had in God. I prayed, I believed, I trusted, I acted, I prayed, I fasted, I seated. I did everything I should do for my healing, and I'm still miserable. I'm still not sick. I'm still sick. I'm still diseased. I still can't get rid of this in my body. So God must have failed me, or he's not real. No. You're thinking it's a method, and you're not living and dwelling in him. You're not abiding in him. When you get hurt, curse words ought not come out of your mouth. What ought to come out of your mouth is the word of God. When you're disappointed in life, disappointment ought not come out of your mouth. The word of God ought to come out of your mouth. The word of life ought to come out of your mouth. And that could only happen if you're abiding in him, dwelling in him. We know manuals, we know TV, you know, TV program more than we know God. More than we know the word of God. Jesus said, he said, here are the issues of life. He said, learn of them. But how many of us actually take time to learn the word of God? You wonder why your life screwed up? He didn't say learn principles. He said, learn the word of God. For two years of my life, I'd done nothing but read and reread and reread and reread and reread the Old Testament. I don't know how many years I was saved before I started studying it. I just read it. You know the problem with studying it before you know it? You're compartmentalized or segmented in your faith. And the Holy Spirit can't take you past what somebody taught you. But when you get a foundation of the word, now you can be taught because the Holy Spirit can can build on what somebody else is teaching you. He said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. He said, abide in me. Secondly, know your place. You want to abide in God? You want the blessings? You want want to walk in, in the favor of God? Know your place. That's the pre qualifier. Now, I know the scripture tells us, you know, people ta- teach us in word of faith, and I, and I hate to say that because I am word of faith. I just don't like the way they perverted it. Command ye me, saith the Lord, concerning the works of my hands, and I will do it. Who do we think we are commanding God? I can't even go to God and say, God, I did this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Now, I expect you to meet my end. Now, I will remind, I say, Lord, I've done this and this to the best of my ability. I throw that in there because, you know, I, before he throws something back at me. <laughs> I throw that in there real quick. You know, Lord, I just did it my best ability. I know I messed up. I know I missed something. I know I cut some corners, but it was to the best of my ability. If you give me more ability, I'll do better. But I'm calling upon you. Know your place in God. When you know your place in God, you know, first of all, he called you to be a worshiper. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. How how am I thankful and blessed unto him and thanking his name when this becomes the object of my desire in church? Something come over me. I just wanted to slam this down for the moment, but it cost me. So thank God the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. This is the most disgusting thing we've ever brought into church. Thank you. (laughs) 
Now, any minute now, my phone will probably ring. <laughs> It'll be one of my kids that know I'm in church. <laughs> Why? Because we don't know our place. This is not your time. This is his time. And are you giving him your all? Or are you thinking about your hunger pain right now? Are you giving him your all? Or are you thinking about where you're going to go, what you're going to do, and how you're going to do it? Are you giving him your all? Or are you thinking about, ooh, look at them. They think they're somebody. Or are you getting mad because I'm calling you out on this? Know your place. Let me share something with you. God is not here for you. That's a byproduct of salvation. But we're here for him. It is such a joy and blessing that he called me to cleanse me. He called me to fill me with his spirit. He called me to deliver me from me. He called me to transform me into his image that I could be an expression of his goodness and it was all for me, not for him. And how dare me think that he's here for me. Oh God, you're blessed that I'm here. Because I can sing, I can organize, I can structure. You're here doing worship for one thing, to worship. He said, lift up them feeble hands that hang down. That is a command. Know your place. No matter where you go, if you don't know your place, you get in trouble. Amen. In the prison yard, man, they got a line. You got to walk this line. What happens? You say, I ain't walking that line. I'm walking over here. I'm following the red line, not the yellow line. What's going to happen to you? You're going to be in trouble. How about when your commanding officer tells you to stand at attention? <laughs> you kidding? I feel like sitting at ease right now. <laughs> You're going to get in trouble. So that when they pull you over to get out of the car. Hey, you, you, you must be smoking something. I ain't getting out of this car. They're going to pull you out. And God tells us, lift up them feeble hands and hang down. And we don't do it because we don't know our place. He's here for us. We're not here for him. Or we're here for him. He's not here for us. It's a lying devil. <laughs> Isaiah 64. Verse 8, let's read. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay. And you are the potter, and we are all the work of your hand. I don't want to go through this, but God says, I've got a peaceable fruit of righteousness they're going to bring forth out of this. Just go through it. Trust me. Let me guide you. Let me direct you. Do all things without murmuring and complaining. But I, don't, I want my voice to be made known. I want to know that I'm dissatisfied with you, God. And he says, shh. Yeah. Amen. You're the clay. Amen. And sometimes he'll take you and he'll <laughs> smack you. He'll spin that wheel and your life feels like it's go, all chaos. But when you allow him to mold it and shape it. Amen. And it can't be done. Without your trust. Yeah. Amen. And I say, oh, I trust God. See, that's a principle of obtaining God's blessings. Right. And the United States government, on their bills, it says, where does it say? This is a new one, might not say it now. Oh, yeah, it does. In God we trust. You cannot obtain and walk in the blessings of God without trust. Amen. And I don't think there's hand in here that would go up and say, I don't trust God. 
But I could show in a second how you don't trust God. The very money that we keep away from God. The tithe. Come on. The one who owns this, the government agency that owns this, tells you don't trust this, trust God. But I can't trust God with 10%. But I can trust this. But I want God's blessings. But I can't trust him. Now don't get me wrong, man. I I have a hard time with this, especially now because I know things are hard. Right, and, and, and it's very difficult for you know we're you know we're paying five thousand dollars a year above our standard living just to keep up with where we're at now. And I know we're paying over six dollars a gallon, but my God, you're eating burritos, going to Taco Bell, Jack in the Box, McDonald's, and vacations. But I'm getting something out of that. But my God, I'm not getting nothing except just get my money to the church, man. The church, the church, church, church. Oh, just want my money. So I'm gonna keep it in my pocket. But the money you got in your pocket is telling you to trust God with it. Malachi chapter 3, he tells you why. So that I can open up the windows of heaven and pour you out of blessings you cannot contain. But I can't trust God with that on a regular basis to walk in the blessings because I don't have that kind of trust. Well, how come I'm not walking in the blessings? Because you're not meeting the pre-qualifications. You're meeting the ones you want to meet. See, we've got people here that really can't afford toilet paper. And they don't miss their tithe. And God blesses them above and beyond. The bottom line is, we don't trust God enough. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone because I really don't like talking about that. That's between you and God, but I have to bring it out and let you know what he says. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Turn your Bibles there. Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. My $5 bill, my $100 bill can get me X, X, and X. And by my God, at the end of the year, I look at my donation and go, man, I could have bought this, that, and the other thing. How do you know God didn't de- rebuke the devourer from destroying the other 80%, 90%, 80% that you didn't give? I trusted him. Yes. I've seen the people in this ministry that, that gave when they didn't have to give, and they got to give now. God bless them above and beyond because they were faithful in their giving. And I'm not that kind of preacher that talks about money and giving because, again, you know, I, I, I'm just sharing with you what I believe the Lord wants me to share with you this morning. He says, trust in and be confident in God. I'm confident that God will bless me. I'm confident that God will keep me. I'm confident that God will strengthen me. If you don't have trust in God, you don't, you're not fulfilling one of the pre-qualifiers to walk in his blessings. See, all this stuff that you learn mean nothing if you don't trust him. I'm not just talking about trusting him with my money. I'm trusting him with my family. I'm trusting him with my life. I'm trusting him with me. It's a hard thing to learn trust. You never trusted in your life. And trust did not come easy for me. I tested God, and God proved himself to me. All he had to do was prove himself one time, and then I surrendered. How many times has God got to prove himself to you? The bottom, bottom, bottom line is we're selfish with what we want and stingy with what God wants. You're using stolen, stolen toilet paper here, stolen electricity, And I bet you came up and got a lottery ticket. (laughs) Deuteronomy 29. Somebody paid for that lottery ticket. And it wasn't you. (laughs) Turn around and ask somebody, was it you? (laughs) Let's read 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But he reveals that which are revealed belong to us and to our children. 
forever that we may do all the words of his law. When you trust him, God will guide you, reveal to you, and speak to you why you're going through what you're going through and what you, what's going on in your life. You're not going to be in the dark. We think we can understand this through some kind of method. No, it's trust. When, he trust. when you trust him and you walk in the darkness, he's in the darkness and he tells you, keep walking forward. Keep trusting me. He says, the blessings are ahead. And because you're trusting him, you go forward anyway. He told Moses, Moses, I'm sending you to a land of plenty, land flowing with milk and honey. He says, he says don't be fearful because there'll be an angel behind you and he'll tell you to go right. He'll tell you to go left. He'll tell you to go straight. See, we're not hearing that because we're not trusting. We talk about blind faith. Faith is not blind, my friend. God will direct you. He will guide you. But he can't direct you and guide you when you don't follow his principles to obtain, obtain his blessings. You think his, ble his, bless his blessings don't come just through the tithe. I'm not talking about getting blessings through the tithe. I'm saying that's the principle he uses to get you to trust him. <sighs> Be willing and obedient. We're all willing, but we ain't obedient. I'm willing to serve the Lord, but I'm not obedient to go through the fire. I'm willing to trust God, but I'm not willing to go through the darkness to, 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 so that I can learn that trust. I'm willing to praise him when I feel good, but I'm not obedient to praise him when I feel miserable. David's worst point in his life, his child died, and he worshipped the Lord. Job lost everybody, and he worshipped the Lord. Sarah's heartbroken because she's not bearing a child. And the angel of the Lord comes by and said, this time next year, your wife will have a child. And she got so indignant, she laughed about it because she thought it was mockery. Because she did not trust God and understand how God moves. Now let me share, you might think this is sacrilegious, but what kind of God are you serving that he doesn't give you the direction you need? Nothing ought to take you by surprise. And if it comes by and you were unaware of it, you should still have the peace of God. He said, the peace of God that passes all understanding. He says, I give you this peace that passes all understanding. No matter what comes your way, you'll not lose your confidence. You'll not lose your trust. It's not a method. It's a relationship. If you abide in me and my words, my words, my words abide in you. What words are abiding in you? Is it your uncle's words when he, was, when he was raising you up and telling you how to act like a man? Is it your father's words when he told you men don't cry, act right, straighten up, do right? Come on, talk to me. Or is it the word of God abiding in you that's directing you? See, we just need to cut loose everything that's not God. Isaiah 119. Let's read. If you're willing and obedient, there's a difference between the two. I'm willing to come to church, but I'm not obedient to worship. I'm willing to come praise him, but I'm not willing to lift up my voice. I'm looking around here. There's not one of us in here that don't have a big mouth. <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all I listen to talking, go, man, you know, tone it down a couple octaves. I'm right next to you. <laughs> I'm right next to you. I'm not across the room. Some of us don't know how to whisper if we were paid. <laughs> but yet when it comes to worship, I can hear you. I'm not talking to you. Well, God can't hear you either. He said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Yes. Trumpets are irritating. I've lived next door to somebody one time playing the trumpet, practicing the trumpet. Loud. You cannot play a trumpet softly. They're loud. They're irritating until they learn how to play it. Your worship may be irritating to you to learn the beauty of his holiness and you understand what worship does. I'm willing to come in, but I'm not obedient 
to become a fool for Christ's sake. Amen. I'm willing to, you know, do this because this is cool. That's so uncool. My face just got all contorted. I don't even want to see it. That's just not cool. So I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to sit here and do this because this is cool. You're willing, but you're not obedient. Don't you know that the Holy Spirit draws you into worship himself? He draws us into worship himself. What would happen in here if every heart and every soul was bent on worshiping him in the beauty of his holiness? You say, we got it wrong. We're not worshiping him because everything is going great in my life. I'm not worshiping him because I won the lottery or I got a big raise. I'm not worshiping him because I just bought this big, beautiful home. I'm not worshiping because everything's perfect in my life. I'm worshiping him because he is God. Period. Without him, I am nothing. I'm worshiping him because I could have and it should have been dead. But he saw fit to save me, protect me, keep me, and hold me up. I may be miserable. I may be sick in my spirit. I may be troubled. I may be tormented in my mind. I may be so tired I don't want to be here. But you'll never know it by the way I worship him. Willing and obedient. You can't just be willing to come to church. Don't go to church. Well, I guess so. This is not a got to. This is a get to. Just like you get to go on vacation, you get to go on a motorcycle ride, you get to go on a cruise, you get to do all these other things. You're excited about that. I ain't never seen one brother in here, man, you want to go on a bike ride? Well, I guess so. <laughs> want to go to a car show? Well, okay. Excited about it. Want to go to the beach? Nah, I don't want to go to the beach. It's too cold, too hot, man. I don't want to go to the beach. No, we're excited to do it because it's something we get to do. We got some of y'all going camping today after church. You've been excited all week, preparing all week. See, when you're excited about something, you prepare for it. How many of us didn't prepare for church? Because you weren't excited about it. It's my duty. Thank God you're willing to be here. But are you obedience in being here? Got out of bed at the last minute. Lost a fight with the iron. <laughs> Amen. I'm sorry. I'm a pro- strong proponent. My name should have been Iron Mike. <laughs> I believe in ironing my clothes. My t-shirts. Hello? See, youngsters don't know nothing about that. Right. Amen. Right. Where we at? If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. He's telling us right there. You want good things in your life? Be willing and obedient. Right. It's not the formula. Be willing and obedient. Here I am, God. You know how tore up I am, but here I am. I'm your man. I'm going to worship you in the beauty of your holiness. I'm going to lift up your name. I'm going to declare your goodness no matter what's going on in my life. And what's going to happen, you're going to walk out of here. Your perspective is going to be different. It's not a principle. You go spend all your money you want to on those books. Those books ain't going to do nothing but collect dust. That's all they're going to do. Collect dust because it's more than a principle. Pray. God ordained prayers. These are prerequisites. There's very few God ordained prayers in the Bible. The prayer Jabez is not a God ordained prayer. That was God ordained for Jabez, not you. Oh, but it works, and we're going to make a book, and we're going to sell them money, make a bunch of money on these suckers. They're looking for a quick fix. And I did it, and it worked for me, my brother, here. I want to give it to you, you didn't even buy it. Here, use it. And the enemy sucks you in. There are prerequisites to walking in the blessings. Salvation's free. 
but the prerequisite is going to cost you everything. Well, I'm going to pray because I know I should pray. Are you praying God-ordained prayers? Are you praying, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me? Lord, save my mom, save my dad, save my brother, save my sister. Heal my mom, heal my dad, heal my sister. Why don't you live like you're a godly man or woman and they're going to desire what you got? Hello? When's the last time somebody came and said, you know what, I ain't seen or heard or I been around a Christian like you for a long time. And that should be a compliment. It should be a compliment. Go to John chapter 14. Pray God-ordained prayers. And I will do, I myself will grant whatever you ask in my name as presenting all that I am. That sounds like a method. Listen to this. Is your prayer meeting the demand? He said, I will ask whatsoever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified and extolled through the Son. Is the Father glorified by you receiving what you're asking for? Is the Father glorified by you living in a bigger, better house than the one you have now? Is the Father glorified by you getting a bigger, better car, or are you glorified? Is the Father glorified by your selfish desire for material things? Here's what he said in his word. He says, I know what you have need of, and before you asking, I will answer you. I don't even bother praying for things anymore. I delight myself in him and all of a sudden turn around the things I've been desiring starts coming my way because I'm delighting in him. That's a prerequisite. My delight, my joy, my pleasure is in the God that I serve. The prerequisite is asking in the name of Jesus. The prerequisite is, is he glorified in the very thing that you're asking for? Oh yeah, God's glorified if I make $40 an hour instead of 30 how is God glorified over that? Oh, I can give more. You don't even give God now. <laughs> Matthew 9. You want to pray God-ordained prayer? When's the last time you prayed this prayer? You want God to bless you, meet these prerequisites. Then the blessings of God will run you down and take you over. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest indeed is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know why the laborers are few? Because everybody got comfortable, they're blessed, they're super, they're super uh, 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 active in their life, and they ain't got time for spiritual things no more. Right. I was, went through some of the pictures on my computer, and I seen one of the last times we went out here in the community to pick up garbage. There was like 30-something people in that picture. Today, I'm lucky if I can get 10. Hello? So pray the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust laborers into the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. When's the last time you prayed, God send laborers into the harvest? Instead of praying for your mother, father, brother, sister, children to be saved. Have, why don't you pray, God, send somebody to them to open up their understanding. Send somebody to them that may bring the plan of salvation to them. He didn't say pray for the salvation. He said pray for the harvest. He said pray for the laborers. He didn't say you couldn't send them to them. Pray for the laborers. Oh, but I'm using these principles so I can get what I want. They're not principles. They're prerequisites to walk in his blessings. You cannot walk in God's blessings without meeting his prerequisites. It don't work like that. Methodologies are never God's plan. Amen. It's man's plan to build a church and to rob you of your victory in God and to think that there was a method. If you want to gain your higher spiritual life, lose this one here on earth. Did you, did you gain something this morning? Did you learn something?